We're going to trigger the Alpine Stars Tech Air system, but we're doing it manually. You, this cannot be done in normal circumstances. We have a lead from the back of the airbag system to the laptop where Jenny is over there, and she is going to trigger it, and it will go off, and you'll be able to see what it's like when the airbag goes off. She's only going to trigger it when I say now. <laughs> oh. I didn't say now. I said you trigger it when I say now, and I haven't said now. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Hello and welcome to Adventure Bike TV. This is the last of the old school Adventure Bike TVs before we get to the new one, which is next month, because this is the last one. I'll explain it all after the bike review, which is the AJP PR7. Our Max Pannier has won many awards, including Ride Magazine Recommended and Adventure Bike TV's Best in Test. Metal Mule, engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Over the last two or three years, there's been a particular adventure bike that we've heard a lot about, but not seen much. It's been mainly rumors and conjecture. You might even say, it's kind of been hiding in the shadows, but now it's come out into the light. So the AJP PR7 Adventure is finally out of the shadows, but where does it sit against its competitors? I guess the logical comparison would be against something like the CCM 450, maybe even the 500 EXE and definitely 701 Husqvarna. It is obviously not a bike built for long stretches of tarmac riding and if you were going to do an adventure that was 80 or 90 percent tarmac I'm pretty sure this wouldn't be the bike for you which is why we're going to be spending the whole of this test off-road. It was three years ago that I tested the AJP PR4 and PR5 Rally. Even then there were rumours of a 600 plus cc adventure bike, so it has taken a while. But luckily AJP took a leaf out of the PR5 Rally's manual and built us an adventure bike that oozes rally juices. But first things first, the engine size. This is a little bit confusing. You might be inclined to think that from the PR7 it's a 700cc bike or from the little yellow 650 sticker above the exhaust that it's a 650cc bike. Ah no! It's a 600cc bike based on the SWM 600 engine. Not that it matters even a little bit but it is still confusing. There is absolutely no doubt that this motorcycle is built for going off-road and I could ride it all day in any conditions that I could myself physically cope with because it's actually really comfortable, it's really quick, it brakes and it reminds me of two things. One is it reminds me how old my old 525 EXC is now but then again it's a brand new bike and it also 
to me is the bike that I always wanted the CCM 450 to be because it's just got that bit more power, the engine's smoother. I like to just ride it all day. Is this a good time to talk about the, uh, the bike, Tom? You know, second lot of thoughts after another couple of hours of riding? It's nothing to do with the fact you got it stuck then. Well, when you say stuck, I mean it's axle deep in mud, but it'll get it, it'll come out, so it's not kind of permanently stuck. So it's just the fact you're old now because you've had your 50th birthday and you don't have the energy to get it out of the stuck mud? No, not at all. No, I just underestimated the depth of the mud when I thought it would be a really cool idea to ride down the gully. Uh, but I'm still loving riding it. Not too sure about that same some tablet though. It's either pure genius or the stupidest idea of anything that anybody's ever put on a motorbike. Only time will tell. So AJP says the PR7 is in a class of its own and redefines the adventure bike concept. I'm sure we've heard those words before from many places, but the PR7 is certainly in a little niche all of its own. Firstly, it looks like a rally bike, out of the box. You've got the tall rally screen, high handlebars, fully adjustable suspension and decent ground clearance. And it's skinny, but in the right way. The moment you take a look from the front or the back and admire its slimline waist, you know this is more fell runner than strongman. You just know that it's only got exactly what it needs to do the job well with absolutely no need for any fuss and bother. The frame has been designed to minimize weight and maximize strength. It's a hybrid steel and aluminium twin spar assembly, lighter and tighter. The swing arm is aluminium and yoke style, which helps keep unsprung weight low at the rear axle. And this particular fell runner is also very tech savvy because it comes with a Samsung tablet as standard. On the other hand, they've kept it light in terms of techie rider aids. There's no traction control or rider modes. And you know what? I didn't care and I didn't miss them. I was able to ride this bike every bit as well as a bike with the latest wizardry on it. All this means that when AJP say the PR7 Adventure is in a class of its own, they're not far wrong. I like that the fuel tank is not a great big stereotypical adventure lump between your legs. It's under the seat, keeping the centre of gravity as low as possible. It just makes sense. As we were only testing the bike off-road, I couldn't comment with any great authority about its ability on tarmac. But if it's at ease doing 70 on the trails, it's going to be fine on the roads, as long as your ass is made of memory foam. That seat is definitely built for off-road, where you'll spend plenty of time not sitting on it. But I don't think that anybody who wants a PR7 adventure will give a flying monkey. They'll be buying it because it's an out of the box, rally oriented, adventure dual sport machine that is an amazingly capable bike off road. there's one thing that's a little bit frustrating about this bike it's the fact that we've seen so little in the press about it recently and in fact I googled it before I rode it and not much came up which is a real shame because it is a fantastic off-road tool and I think if you were going to go and do a ride that was mainly Tet for example or that was 80% off-road it is the perfect tool for the job because it's comfortable it's fast and it really flattered me as a rider Importantly, I think some people may be put off by the Portuguese manufacturer. However, if you just changed three letters to something a little bit more orange, everybody would be snapping this bike up. Importantly, would I have one in my garage? It's a tough one, because it is a fantastic bike. Yeah, I would. The Metal Mule Max Pannier is the only pannier to use a silicon seal to ensure they're watertight to IP66 classification. Metal Mule. 
Engineer it to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. So, before the bike review, I said I would explain all about what is happening to Adventure Bike TV. We have been listening to our audience, and the main thing we are changing, there is going to be a lot more riding. Of course, the bike review will stay, but there will be a second bike review on every single show, where we will be focusing on the second-hand bike market, and there'll be a presenter that you may recognise. Keeping with the theme of more riding, the Adventure Bike TV team will be going on more adventures, where we want to showcase the most fun you can have on these rides. And uh, we're going to be starting in Belgium. Under the visor, we'll be staying the same, but with a little revamp. We're going to be retaining some of your other favourite bits, but we're going to put them all in an information hub, where we'll be talking about things like great advice for adventures, riding tips, and a brand new top tech. But these will be slightly shorter segments on the show, but you will be able to see the full length versions on the Adventure Bike TV website. Speaking of the Adventure Bike TV website, that's having a big change too. The all new website will have different ways to watch the show. There'll be articles and columnists. Online we'll have new competitions, a wider range of tech than we've ever had before, and the best of the outtakes. All of this is gonna be encapsulated with a brand new look and logo. And lastly, because everyone has been asking for it, there's going to be merchandise, caps, t-shirts, and of course, stickers. Where is my mind? So, please join us on the 1st of December for the biggest change in Adventure Bike TV's history. Now it's time for the advert break, which will continue with the brand new show because I know the people who love our show don't love the adverts, but the show has to pay for itself. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Welcome back from the ecstatically exciting advert break. Now, Molly joins me 
at Sweet Lamb Adventure Riding Academy for top riding tips. On this month's top riding tips, we are, thank goodness, leaving the ruts behind us for a while, but we're going to be talking about going uphill. Okay. Yeah. Firstly, the biggest mistake everybody makes when you go uphills is they leave the approach too late. Okay. If the uphill is like this, Graham, and that's the top and that's the bottom, it isn't. The, bottom, the top is here and the bottom's down there. So your approach is gaining momentum. If you do an uphill properly, you should be able to go out of the top with the throttle off. Right. That's the key. The approach is the key. And that's the be all and end all of it. If you're halfway up, particularly on something like this, and you're in trouble and you have to ask of it, it'll spin out and you're in worse trouble. Okay. Then you're coming backwards. So I've got to grow a bigger set yep. to get some yep. momentum at the bottom Correct. and control it at the top. You're right. Okay. Good throttle control. Okay. Okay. Happy with that? Yep. Let's go then. Let's go. Okay. Okay, Graham, just remember that nice approach. And now start to pull the throttle on and shut off now. Beautiful. Well done. Easy, eh? Bang on, mate. It's steeper so, than it looks. <laughs> so, yeah, it is steep. Yeah. But you've got it all done. Yeah. And you got it done early. Takes all the fatigue out, yeah. which makes it nice and simple. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, as always, a great tip. Well done. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it was one of the things that I kind of thought I had under my belt, yeah. but actually the thing about thinking about the hill from further back, yeah. so you've got the right speed two yes. thirds of the way up, absolutely bang on, yeah. and actually it felt far more controlled. It was, yeah. it was very good. You've got a lot of momentum going into the bottom of the hill. It's, it's done. Yeah. Well done, mate. Okay. Next month, unsurprisingly, we'll be riding downhill. <laughs> And after that marathon, it's time for Under the Visor. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Uh, I'm Alex Jackson. I run Cups that Motorcycle Adventure Tours, uh, which uh, offers tours in South Africa and uh, bespoke tours around Southern Africa. It's not, I, I don't do work with a specific charity. I, I, I work with um, South African national parks, which have their own uh, anti-poaching units. So that's to paint, that tends to be where the, uh, the emphasis is being pushed these days. Although we have in the past worked with um, Helping Rhinos, uh, which is another organization. No, not at all. I'm, I'm, I'm from Leighton Buzzard, which is probably only famous for the great train robbery. <laughs> uh, I, I guess, as a boy, I was brought up on a TV diet of Daktari and Tarzan and the survival program, which probably nobody under 50 will have ever heard of. Um, and that kind of stayed with me. And one time I was in Kenya on my first ever proper safari, as a, just as a tourist, and I saw this little pit in the soil and I couldn't work out how it had got there and there were there were various ones about and so I asked the guy that we were with the guy that was taking us on a walk I said oh, what's this about and he said I oh, said watch this and he showed me it's a thing called an ant lion and it builds this little sand trap so that when an insect comes along it gets caught in it and it's, it's got its lunch and I thought that was fantastic and it kind of turned a light on for me to want to learn more about wildlife um, and so I had a chat with this guy's son who was training to be a ranger. Um, in Kenya, things cost a lot of money back then. So I looked in South Africa and I could get a 12 day sort of touristy type uh, safari guide course for 400 pounds. Now I know people that pay more than 400 pounds for one night in a lodge, let alone 12 days out in the bush. So 
I, I went and did that and I passed the exam and I did it again and again and again. Um, and then I got into the tracking. Um, I recently, recently, maybe last year, passed my um, track and sign uh, professional certificate, which effectively means I got 100% in the uh, evaluation. Uh, and just being there, I think anybody who's been to Africa, who's been into the wildlife side of things, knows that you know it, it gets a little part of you. It's where life began. It's got a, a special energy. I guess it was two two serious interests. Um, I, I I used to work in a corporate industry, and one day decided that I was nearly 50, and I was probably lived longer than I was ever gonna live. So I need to do something that's for me now. And so I, I already ride bikes. I love being in the wildlife. I love being in South Africa. I'd explored South Africa extensively for a good 10 years solo, riding around it. So I thought, well, other people must like doing this. And so I won't lie, I first started taking people there just to subsidize my own riding. You know, as I, I guess a lot of people start that way. And then it got so popular that we, uh, probably just over nine years ago, started uh, Cupset Motorcycle Tours. And luckily enough, being in the uh, wildlife side of things as well, um, I was able to combine the motorcycles and the wildlife. Uh, and in fact, last year, we took the first ever motorcycle group into Kruger National Park, where bikes have always been banned from. Yeah, I think um, I th the knowledge I've built up and the training I've done over the last 14 years, it seems a shame to waste it to three or four days on each bike tour. So what I'm, what I'm looking at doing, and also I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm 60 this year. I'm not gonna ride motorcycles forever at the same level as I'm riding now. I need to find a way of earning some money. The market for general safaris is a lot bigger, but I don't just wanna do like minibus full, full, full of people uh, in, uh, on safari tours. I wanna to maybe put it more of a one-on-one -on -one experience or, or family or, or couples and, and take them out for escorted tours that way. Uh, pr pretty much everywhere I haven't been, but you know what, when you do this job, it, it's, a, it, it's a fantastic lifestyle, but it does take up all your time. So for me to go off and do something else means I've got to stop working to, to go and do that. Um, I guess I'd, I'd, I'm not one of these places just wants, or one of these people who just wants to go somewhere once, because I want also to be able to go back and look again, or, which is how I sort of explored South Africa. I went back and I went back to the same place, but I'd, I'd, I'd go a different way. Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of go to that same place, but go and explore just off to the side of it somewhere. So, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd want to learn much, much more about South Africa and, and Southern Africa as a whole. But at the top of my list at the moment is Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is a fantastic place. They are, personally, from personal experience, the friendliest Africans I've ever met. I had the best time going through Zimbabwe. Unfortunately, it was cut short because uh, I'd had a, an issue with the bike and I, I lost a lot of exploring days. So I had to go through the town because I was on a, a, a calendar for somebody else. Um, but yeah, I've got to get back to Zim. Um, my UK bike is a KTM, a 2007 KTM 990. Um, why did I choose that bike? Because I used to be into sort of like retro naked XJR 1300 type bikes. Um, my brother-in-law was in fact uh, one of the biggest motocross dealers in the country um, who uh, was retiring and I saw this KTM 990 and just fell in love with it and so he, again I won't lie, he managed to get me a very very good price so I had that and then just got the KTM bug and now I own a 1190R in um, South Africa. Um, where will they find me? Uh, well they find us on the website uh, which is cupstapmap.com. Um, probably a lot easier to spell than it is to, uh, to say. Uh, most of the motorcycle shows around the UK, except the big ones, I don't do any C, because for me, as a, as a one-man band, it's just not financially viable to do that. Um, but a lot of the smaller shows around the country, um, I would say I probably meet 95% of my clients before I go away. And if even if they've booked over the web, if they live in the UK somewhere, I will go along and meet them first so that everybody knows exactly what they've got to offer. So if you do want to book up, if you want us to put your booking forms in, great, but uh, we also probably have to catch up. Don't ride here.
right here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight, proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Now it's time for adventure advice with Claire, where she rounds up her advice about shipping, talking about the things you cannot take with you. And welcome to Adventure Advice. I'm Claire from Expedition 52 and today we are with Motor Freight talking about shipping. And here with me is Tim. And Tim's going to be talking specifically about what you can and can't take with you in your crated box for shipping. So I've got this box in front of me. Do you want to tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah, well, basically these are all the things that we have to take out of people's luggage because they can't go through uh, the freighting process. Okay. It's not dictated by us that wants to steal stuff from people's bikes. <laughs> these are charitied off at the end. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's to keep people safe basically. It's to stop things going wrong within the aircraft, recent terror threats. For whatever reason, these items are deemed um, unfreightable. There's a lot of stuff in here. I mean, just having a look. I mean... Yeah. What is even that? That's that's just some oil that people have brought. And and this is what you find when they come in. So I mean, is that air pressure canisters? Yeah. So basically, I'll go through it a little bit more. Yeah, if you would. Um. So basically, the whole things, uh, the whole bike in the crate is X-rayed, and these things will flag up. So to stop any delay to um, the customer, we will go through and find these things. Okay. So you've got your oils, Red X for whatever reason, your lighters. Matches. Yeah, that obviously. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Other things that flag up, um, uh, anything basically with a hazard label. So that's your antibacterial gel. Huh. Wouldn't yeah. have thought of that one, but fair enough. Right, big one that people always forget about, batteries. You know, they're little things that could hide down in your luggage. Yeah. Yeah, they are it's... dangerous. Lithium, yeah, they'll, you know, ignition. Um, your GoPro batteries, just take them with you, find some other way to do it. Um, then you pressurise stuff. Did, did somebody pack that? It is a lot, yeah. It happens often. That's insane. So, yeah. with other pressurised stuff, you've got your fly sprays, um, your chain lube. I'm guessing if something goes off like this, this is not going to be a small no, thing. No, it, it'll a plane, be a chain right? reaction. Other things will go off and, you know, you wouldn't want to be in that plane when it does go off. <laughs> no, let's, let's avoid that. WD-40. Yep. You've got your CO2 capsules. These are big ones. These will go off. And you've got even the bigger ones that go inside these... Um, inflatable jackets now okay um, ah. they can't go in at all um some other ones you might not think about in your puncture repair kit you'll have a rubber solution so you'll, you'll have got three bad ones on there yeah that's kind of obvious but i, th I guess once you see it you know about it mm. but you wouldn't think of it as a puncture repair no, kit no these, these are often these are often forgotten about and um yeah so okay let's see these things another one ginger i know about this sun cream no flags can't take that so but put it in your personal Belongings, take it on the on the plane as long as it's well, less than one fifty. When you're out there, it's cheaper. Exactly. Fab. Uh, heat pads. If you're weak enough to wear heat pads, if you need them in your socks, shoes, or whatever, to keep yourself warm wherever <laughs> you know. There we go. Um, <laughs> or, that's it. Or just man up. <laughs> insects, insect spray. You deet. There we go. You got two bad ones on there. Yeah. That's bad. That's, that's bad as well. Another one, epoxy. So you have got your metal epoxies, so, steel, aluminium. Doesn't matter what it is. Just in essence, anything fluid, squishy, just get rid of, right? Anything with a hazard label, basically. Okay. Um, and then you've got your epoxy uh, glues there as well. Yeah, and you can see there's actually like some really obvious warning labels and stuff on some of them, but there's some that wouldn't be like, like for example, the sun creams. Not all of them it necessarily would, it would, have it. It but... may flag on an X-ray, so we don't want any delays for our customers, I was which is the worst for a start of a trip. So if something did get flagged, what happens? Basically. We, we ensure that we take it out and okay. we'll, we'll let people know and then if they don't come and collect it, it's all raffled off at a charity. Okay, and so if it did get to an airport and somebody did, it somehow something, one of these things did get left in there, it gets scanned, it gets flagged up, does that mean major delays for someone? Um, we will have to go down and remove the item from the crate. Well, that's a bit pants. Mm. Yeah, so we don't really want to do that. Huh, well, that seems like quite an obvious thing to go through. Although, like I said, things like batteries and bits and bobs, I certainly didn't really 
think about or know about. So that's really awesome. And at the end of the day, we want you to be able to get on the plane as quickly as possible, help these guys get your package all sorted nice and easily. So this is great things to think about prior to packing up your bike. Lovely speaking to you guys. We'll catch you again next time on Adventure Advice. Well, that was the show. And I'm sort of a little bit sad because it's the end of an era with the old school show, but I am super excited. And Tom is even more excited than me about the brand new show. Join us on the 1st of December.